Conley has the whole has the whole monopoly. I don't know who that son of a bitch thinks he is. Welcome to Laid Back Law with your favorite lawyers from around the interwebs. No. Here's Morgan is doing the hide my boner lean. <laughs> Look at him. I think this is actually the first time that a billionaire cut safety standards and it was the billionaire themselves that died. And that's what made that's what made Poliers. I don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name. Polyev. I'm board certified criminal trial law in Florida. I'm your man. Of course, you have to compensate me. Discussing the most pressing of topics every Friday at noon Eastern time. I, mean, I, I did this way before him. I had the big brain panel before Eric Hunley even existed. Is it your testimony today that you personally witnessed President Joe Biden commit a crime? I believe the fact that he was sitting with me while I was putting together. a Did you deal, witness the president commit it, it, a crime? Is it your testimony today? Yes. And what crime do you have you witnessed? How much time do I have to go through it? It is simple. You name the crime. Uh, Did you watch him steal something? Cor- corruption statutes, RICO and conspiracy. What is it? What is Sarah. what is the crime, sir? You, you specifically you, just, uh, you keep uh, you asked me to answer the question. I answered the question. No, Rico, you're obviously not familiar with corruption. Excuse statutes. me, sir. Excuse Sarah. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Rico is not a crime. It is a category. What uh, is no. the it's a category crime. of crimes that you're then charged? You have charges. A long hundred. You have charges. Statutes. Sir, please the name, name. exact statute on Rico. Yes. I'll, well, it's funny in this committee room. Everyone's not here. There's over. All right. Sir, I reclaim my lawyers time. that I went to law school. I, recla- I, reclaim I, reclaim I reclaim my time. I reclaim my time. Oh, oh you're pushing back. I reclaim my time. I, I'm supposed to show throw chip shots. OK, so good. I have some lawyers on here. This is great. It leads into a perfect first story. We got Phil Holloway back, Andrea Burkhart back, Norm Pattis, new to the panel, and Mike Boyer, also new to the panel. Folks, you may recognize Norm Pattis as being Alex Jones's lawyer at Sandy Hook. He's got a lot of press time in there. And Mike Boyer is known as a craft counselor with beer, I would say. Yes, sir. Yeah, a little bit of that. I think I think I've been referred to as the Tom Brady of beer law. Tom Brady of beer law. I like that. I like that. All right. So, help me out here. Um, should I get my legal education from AOC? Phil, I'll go to you. <laughs> well, uh, AOC is full of shit. Uh, no, look. Um, I I put I, tw- I put this on my Twitter feed. I guess it was yesterday. I I took a screenshot of the. Trump Rico indictment here in Atlanta that we're all so familiar with now. And like count one literally says, you know, these eight people, his names, eight or 10, however many they are that are on that Rico count says hereby charge and accuse Donald Trump and all these other people with count one violation of the Rico law. I mean, it's like, there it is. It's a crime. It's an actual statute. Now, sure. There's a lot of different ways you can, you can, uh, violate rico you can violate rico driving home from your office if you're not careful because there's so many uh so many hooks to get you in there but there's a federal rico law and there's a state rico law in most states i guess and and it is a a criminal statute and so yes it is a crime and it's got elements just like every other offense such as traditional crimes like murder but um she uh she absolutely showed her ignorance on that one and i gotta tell you it was good for a lot of laughs. It's just hilarious. <laughs> so it's a, in, in other words, she's saying, um, "Oh, homicide isn't a charge; it's a category." Yeah, I mean, well, that would that actually would be true because homicide is not a crime. It's a it, homicide is a category of death, uh, not all of which are criminal. So <laughs> if she had said something like that, I might have thought she had a brain cell that was still living in her head, but. <laughs> But what she said was just so patently untrue and and laughable. And some of the, I got to tell you, some of the memes that are, you can find uh, out on social media, there's one of her wearing like a, a helmet while she's up there shaking her head. Uh, she really, really showed herself to be a buffoon, in my opinion. Yeah, I saw the uh, spinning Ziggy hat um, <laughs> yeah. meme. It looked like somebody had. Uh, Andrea, any thoughts uh, from me on this? I mean, I think that this is kind of classic uh politician 
maneuvering. Uh, she's making a semantic argument. It doesn't have really any legal significance whatsoever. Uh, did you witness a crime? I mean, you can, you can always make an argument that somebody didn't witness a crime because they didn't witness each and every element of the crime. Even with something like a murder, you can say, well, you didn't actually know what was in their head at the time they committed the crime. You don't know if it was intentional. You don't know if it was premeditated. You don't know for sure that beyond a reasonable doubt that it wasn't self-defense at the time that it took place. And so you know, he's clearly testifying that he witnessed parts of a conspiracy that he believes are criminal. Uh, and, and, you know, as Phil pointed out, yes, RICO is very much a criminal statute that, that people can be charged and, and convicted with. So to me, it was, you know, it's, it's just classic showmanship. She knew the cameras were on. She thought she was going to have a, an opportunity to, to make a big gotcha moment and, and sound, you know, really smart. But unfortunately, to people who do know what she's talking about, uh, it had rather the opposite effect. All right. Now, I want to shift because Rico leads right into Atlanta. And I believe Bobby. Norm and Mike, you have been covering as well as obviously Phil, the Fanny Follies or whatever you want to call them. Um, Norm, any thoughts or updates on it? And I definitely want the discussion. You know, everybody jump in, you know, Phil or yeah, whatever. You know, my, my sense is that there's very little doubt that Fanny or Fanny or however you pronounce it, um, violated her duty of candor toward the tribunal. Um, when you talk about an odor of, of whatever it was. Mendacity. Yeah, man, mendacity. <laughs> that, that basically says it smells like she lied. And if a prosecutor who's supposed to be a minister of justice and to strike fair but hard blows is caught lying to the court, I don't care whether it's prejudicial or not. She's got to be off the case and potentially out of office. And so I think the, the ju Judge McAfee whiffed. He had an opportunity to see the <laughs> Um, somebody else is going to have to pick it up. I, I, I know it's, it's been certified for an immediate appeal. I expect the appellate court will zone in on that. The fact of the matter is, that I think she lied. And if she did, she shouldn't be in that office, um, period, regardless of any prejudice. I agree. Um, Phil, what, what what is the uh, status on it right now? Well, she's still in office. Uh, we, we've seen uh, this week, you know, she's using another. He likes to use Rico a lot. Um, she used it a number of years ago when she was a assistant DA, she prosecuted a bunch of school teachers under the Atlanta school teachers under the racketeering law um, for allegations of having cheated on standardized testing. She's using it now against um, the rapper young thug and we call it the YSL trial. Um, she's using rap lyrics um, as evidence in the case. Um, which has really pissed off the, the music industry here, which is big here in Atlanta, by the way. Um, she recently, uh, the, the artist Ludacris lives here and his manager was recently arrested wrongly, I should say, mm -hmm. falsely arrested. Um, but I think he was kept in jail for an, well, an, an excessive period of time for something he was innocent of. And I, so I think that through all of these things that she's doing, she's, uh, she's continuing to to piss off a lot of people in Atlanta, a lot of people that she doesn't want to, she, she really doesn't want to piss off, but the music folks are, are big and, and they don't like her using rap lyrics um, as evidence, in, you know, in a criminal racketeering case, which by the way, started like a year and a half ago. And now one of the lawyers is saying it might last until 2027. It started like with 20 something defendants. And now the judge has, um, over time, severed out a few of them here and there. Do they but, go to trial uh, every day? I mean, how does it? Yeah, they are. Yeah. And so the jury's got to sit there. And now he's talking about it can go till 2027. I, I know some how lawyers who have a job. I mean, well, I, 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 that's I'm the thinking problem. The jury. You can't. I mean, those of us who actually have to actually still go to court, myself included, I, I couldn't take just one case uh, to the exclusion of all others and still feed my family. So, and some of those folks were court appointed and they were making like 45, 50, 50 bucks an hour or something. And they were starving to death on top of it. No, I mean the jurors. I mean, oh. no offense, but well, they yeah, get $25 I, I love, a day. They'll be fine. Oh, oh yeah. There you go. I'm, I'm, I'm just here thinking that's my worst nightmare. Could you imagine that? I mean, you, no, it's a job three years. I can't that, imagine that's, it. No, that's, that's abusive. And this judge, and, and look, and I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a, a show on it myself on, on my channel as soon as I can find the right person to help me fully understand it. Because I've, 
purposely, I have not been following all the, the machinations of this case um, because there's, there's not enough room in my brain. I think it would explode. But this judge, you know, he's, he's, he was putting jurors in jail or threatening to, he, he, he threatened like, like one of the jurors who was late or missed a day or something made her write an, it's like it's long essay. He ordered an attorney in the case before jury selection to, to do, uh, to like buy lunch for all the other lawyers as, as some kind of punishment for what he viewed something oh, that yeah. was contemptible for asking a certain question. Um, lots of, lots of just crazy shenanigans going on with this judge in this trial um, and more than I've been able to keep up with. So when I can find the right local um, YSL trial expert, I'm going to, we're going to do more on that, but, but Fannie Willis is a certainly getting back to, to your point. She is no stranger to controversy and, uh, this YSL trial is 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 almost as um, just nonsensical as the whole uh, disqualification motion was. Phil, does I, anybody know what the daily compensation is for jurors? In, yeah, twenty five dollars. Twenty five. Ooh, yeah. There we go. You know what? It, this is almost perfect because the only people who could survive being on the jury are those who don't have a job. Yeah. And I don't know what necessarily, but that may have implications depending on their taste and, and music and things like that as to the result. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, Mike, I'm curious, and we'll start the conversation here. What do you what are your thoughts on the whole um, using music lyrics to prosecute somebody? There's the obvious you know aspect, in my opinion, of it being ludicrous that it's lyrics. However, out Andrea's way, there is an author who wrote the book, How to Kill Your Husband, who was just convicted of killing her husband. So I, I, I feel like it could kind of go both ways. Like if the lyrics happen to line up perfectly with evidence, could they be seen as evidence? Or is it like Grand Theft Auto in real life? Yeah, I think that the, the real problem is is, in, is is translating it into something meaningful for a try for a finder of fact and for uh, a, you know the courtroom, right? I think that it's perfectly reasonable to assume that uh, modern rap and especially in, in today's day and age, I think you've got uh, Trapland Pat down in Florida. There's some sort of feud between the two of them. You can kind of research that on YouTube, and it's it's kind of nuts the way that these sort of feuding factions uh, use rap to sort of actually wage uh, sort of fifth dimensional warfare against one another down there. Certainly, I think that in the abstract, there's something useful or dispositive of criminal activity that could be used. The problem is you don't have anybody in the courtroom that's competent to actually absorb and then package it for a court to, uh, I guess, review appropriately, right? And so for, for that reason, I think it's not even practical. I do think that fundamentally there's a problem with using uh, the medium of, of artistic expression to think that, you know, that, that we can, you know, convict somebody or use that as evidence to put them into, uh, into the criminal justice system more broadly. Right. But that's not also the same as saying that, Hey, these guys are using rap lyrics. They're saying things that are highly specific. They're making reference, uh, whether it's, you know, to people's, uh, you know, given name, stage name, whatever else. Um, yeah, it's all in there. I don't, I, I, nobody who's, uh, who listens to rap and I do, nobody is under the illusion that it's, it's all fabricated. Now, a lot of it is, but certainly there is, uh, there is essence to where it comes from, right? They're not fiction writers in the way that, you know, a novelist might be right. Uh, they're using real life experience and they're using the modern social media era to, to kind of build a, a, a persona around that. Right. So that is the give and take. You know, I think that there's an interesting parallel. You know, I, I was involved in the Proud Boys criminal insurrection trial that lasted mm. five and a half months in D.C. And one of the things we complained bitterly about in that case is the government used protected speech. I believe the election was stolen as circumstantial evidence of criminal tent, uh, intent to engage in seditious conspiracy. The parallel here is you've got other core protected First Amendment expressive activity being used to show criminal intent. The problem is that we all have we have a right to run our mouth in this country. Last I checked, and if we don't, I'm in a hell of a lot of trouble. Um, and so, you know, as I, as everybody on this show is, I suspect. And so, you run your mouth, you talk trash, and then you're around something, and the next thing you know, the trash you've talked is 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 admitted as circumstantial evidence of criminal intent. There was a fascinating case last term, Counterman versus Colorado involving the true threat doctrine that warned about over application of these sorts of laws and their chilling effect 
on speech. So I, I would say that the YSL case and the use of expressive activity in this culture, in this context, has a chilling effect on speech. And there ought to be, and you know, we, we're, we're, we're filing a petition in the U.S. Supreme Court probably next week you know, on behalf of one of Alex Jones' people, a guy named Owen Schroyer, who made protected mm -hmm. comments about a stolen election. And he was he then pled guilty to criminal trespass, in effect, um, being on Capitol grounds without authorization. At sentencing, the government asked the court to consider his protected speech. We argued that trespass did not require an intent, and therefore the use of protected speech in this case was altogether wrong, and the court disagreed. So we're going to ask the Supreme Court to construct a test, an intermediate test, that says there has to be some especially probative value um, to, to speech, isolated speech acts, because otherwise, um, if, if in an Internet area, era where everything you say is preserved for all time, um, it's going to be a crime to say anything at some point. So I, I, I couldn't agree more that there are significant First Amendment implications with using something like rap lyrics as evidence mm -hmm. of guilt. Uh, there's some other considerations to uh, something that's come up in Washington state. For example, uh, there was one fairly high profile case where a prosecutor had relied on uh, the fact that the defendants, um, they, they were basically trying to prove that the defendants were gang members. And one of the things that they pointed to was that these gang members like the Latin Kings. Well, we, we have a, you know, Latino Supreme Court justice on the Washington Supreme Court. He's very aware that the Latin Kings have four Grammy Awards. Uh, this is not <laughs> like, you know, some gang special, specialized thing. And so there, there's very much a racial tone to this type of thing as well, that you know, this tends to be leveraged against certain communities. You don't see people's country music listening habits uh, being brought in as evidence of proof of domestic violence or something like that. So it, it does tend to be a one way street. Uh, I, I, I want to just tell a little story because I actually had the pleasure of litigating this particular issue in a murder case where uh, the state did seek to use my client's rap lyrics that he had, uh, you know, drafted in jail uh, as proof of his guilt. Uh, and the argument, as, as was pointed out, is that uh, the, the allegation is always, well, there, this is describing the crime that occurred, so it, it amounts to some type of a, of a confession. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that's extremely, extremely vague. Um, most of the times, you know, you're not naming people by name, you're not talking about acts by name, you're just using this, you know, kind of broad sort of fronting language to you know, talk about how tough you are and how great your homies are and how, you know, you, you, you do stuff for your gang and, and things like that. So uh, I actually, in that particular case, had the investigating, the investigating detective who had found these lyrics uh, write specifically in his report that uh, he didn't believe they had anything to do with the crime. Uh, so nevertheless, the court allowed those in, uh, and I was able to use that for cross-examination. But one of the things that I did do, um, that I would just encourage people to think about if you, if you encounter this issue in jury selection, I went ahead and played for the jury panel. I played them some Cypress Hill and I played them, um, uh, uh, you know, here's something you can't understand how I could just kill a man. Yeah. And, and so we listened to that lyrics and I just went ahead and asked the jury, how many of you think Cypress Hill, these guys actually killed a man? Give me a show of hands. You know, do, do you think that's real? And so we had a whole conversation in injury selection about the relationship between, you know, lyrics and, and fantasy and, and just this, this style of, of music that's out there and, and to what extent it has some kind of relationship with reality and, I think it helped plant the seed with the jury to be skeptical of that type of evidence. Somebody in the chat, I think, said, I shot the sheriff. Yeah, but I didn't shoot the deputy, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, Norm, I, I hate to hijack, but I, uh, while I have you, um, you brought up uh, Owen Schroyer. And the whole Owen Schroyer thing, there's an element of that that really disturbed me. And that was how he got locked up for a relatively short time while on appeal. And it's happened to somebody else. I forgot his name. This kind of bothers me when a case can get overturned on appeal and they serve people serve their entire time. How do they get their time back? You don't. Yeah. No, that's it. You lost. It's over. I know that happened when I was a um, prosecutor in, in the Bronx. That was one of our biggest cases because it was a guy who stole a backpack. And if he would have pled guilty, he would have got like 60 days, wound up serving two years, waiting for trial, couldn't get bail. And then he committed, um, you know, he offed himself after. The trial and it became like a big thing like why would he serve two years waiting for trial for a backpack if he pled a guilty he would get like 30 days so yeah it happens all the time wow i, I i'm sorry i just find that very disturbing especially I mean, the, when it's the, a the answer yeah. 
the system's answer is that almost every state and and I believe the federal system has a, a, a mechanism by which if you can persuade the court that there's a substantial likelihood of, of success on appeal, the court has discretion um, to, to give an appeal bond. But in many states, Connecticut among them, which is my home state, you have, you have no constitutional right to an appeal bond. And, um, and therefore, yeah. you know, into the twilight zone you go, into the land of tears and sorrow. It's know? discretionary here. If, uh, well, this reminds me of something before I forget, and I may have to go before the end of the show. So I want to make, there, there was a situation here recently in Atlanta, just saw this yesterday. There was a guy in a jurisdiction, a county just south of Atlanta, I think it was. He sat in jail pre-trial for 10 years <laughs> without any adjudication of his case. And I, I think it was like a murder case, but the other co-defendants have like all been acquitted. And so the evidence was really, really weak. And a lawyer, uh, Andrew Fleischman, who, who's a friend of mine and a colleague here in Atlanta, I guess he got wind of what was going on and took the guy's case and went, went down there and helped him out because he didn't have a lawyer appointed. He had no lawyer at all working on his case for all these years. And his case was just languishing. Literally, it's just it's a horrifying um a, a breach of the duty that the judges have to make sure stuff like this How doesn't not have a lawyer for 10 years. I, exactly. Yeah, so the, that's, that's on, you know, I think that's on the judge, you know, that's, but that's, and all yeah. uh, the prosecutor too, for that matter, but you, you can't have people sitting in pre-trial confinement for 10 years with no trial and no yeah. lawyer. But in any event, here's what happened. So he, his, he gets a lawyer who decides to go help him and, and he winds up having to take, basically what we call an Alfred plea. I don't know if you guys use those, but it's a, mm -hmm. it's a plea where he doesn't admit guilt, but he, he pleads to like aggravated assault credit and released on the time served to be followed by like 20 more freaking years on probation. Um, oh, God. just, it just so he could get out of jail, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's just, you know, we all know that people, people ask me and in my podcast, I did a whole thing about this. Why do people, why would you plead guilty to something you didn't do? Well, it happens every day. Mm -hmm. all across America in, in your backyard and mine. Uh, but this was an egregious example of the system going wrong. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize how easy it is for cops to get confessions because a lot of times the choice is going home or going to jail. And, you know, if they say, well, you know, you tell me what, oh, what I need to know and yeah. you can go home and that's how they get you. They, they it's, it's confessions very, are real. Yeah. Isn't there a book on that? And I don't know, um, uh, Norm, you might know this. Or Phil, you might, I don't know, a uh, federal wise. I think somebody wrote a book sh showing that you're breaking the law every single day of the year. That it, yeah, that's four felonies a day by Harvey Silvergate or Glate up at, of the Boston Phoenix. And, you know, basically at the time of the founding, there were about 40 or 44 felonies in the uh, in the Constitution. Now, when you mi mix the statutory or match, rather, the statutory definitions of offenses versus the various ways you can commit them, you know, uh, um, conspiracy, accomplice, accessory, this, that and all the things, you can't really count the number of them. So Harvey's point was, you know, you commit four felonies a day every day and prosecutors get a choice about whether to prosecute you. Thus, the element of vindictive prosecution or selecting people for the wrong reasons at the wrong time um, is very much a real thing because prosecutors get to choose. When, every, when everything's a fish, you get to, you get to decide which, which fish you want to hook, you know. Which is why Fannie this, Willis this needs to be week. off that case. This came up this week in, in the U.S. Supreme Court in the Gonzalez versus Trevino argument. Um, that's a case involving a, a, a civil claim for a, a vindictive arrest. Uh, the argument that the the essentially city council, the mayor, um, and, and some of his uh, cohorts, they conspired to basically penalize and, and arrest a, a woman who was a member of the city council who had criticized them uh, for, for just basic policy decisions. Uh, and, and so... It came up uh, in that context. I was a little bit uh, happy to see that it was actually uh, Justice Gorsuch who brought up that exact <laughs> point that you're making. That uh, there are so there there are hundreds hundreds of thousands. I mean, there are so many criminal statutes that we don't even know how many there are. We can't even <laughs> like crazy. identify specifically, you know, how how many possible things you you can be charged with. And so I was just very glad to see that. Somebody on the high court is is aware of this and, and at least vocalizing some type of concern about it. That's but a good even, even, GPT four question. How many federal felonies are there? Oh my you'll god! Break, mm -hmm. You'll break the you'll break Chat GPT. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. My mm -hmm. my function stops at infinity squared. You know. 
But Andrea, even in that case, though, it's interesting because one of the one of the parts was about probable cause. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it's just like, hey, if you, the state has probable cause, they got you. And yes. in this case, they had probable cause because she actually took the document. So it's like, but then you had the selective piece. So now, and, and Thomas, Thomas is a big proponent. He's like, hey, if the state had probable cause, you got no argument. But Gorsuch wants to have, he's, because he was in the dissent for the, for the case that they cited. And he was even saying, well, there's, there's got to be some exception to this. You can't just say probable cause wins the day in all cases. So it's, it's that's going to be a fascinating because I, I want to see how they kind of square that circle. Yeah, okay, I, I do too. And and I think because part of the problem with it is, and, and this this case that case was a very good example. She was charged with a statute that is so broad, so yeah. vague and ambiguous <laughs> so that true. you can interpret all kinds of different acts to fit within it. And so yeah. essentially the facts were she was charged with uh, concealing a government document because during a city council meeting, she accidentally had the petition in her file for like a couple minutes and, and then put it back. And, and so the, the standard, the legal standard is, well, you have to be able to prove that uh, in similar factual circumstances, uh, people wouldn't, wouldn't bring this type of charge against you. Uh, that's how you prove that it's vindictive. And the Fifth Circuit had said, well, you don't have a case because you can't point to other factual circumstances where a city council member accidentally stuck a petition in their file for for, you know, for a couple couple minutes uh, and, and weren't prosecuted for it. So it's it's really a question of how much specificity do, do you have to have in your comparisons before you can draw a reasonable inference that of course nobody would charge somebody for this absolutely ridiculous crime that that's that's you know probably not what ordinary people would contemplate as being yeah. within the, the realm of the statute but that is the job of prosecutors is to take these nebulous statutes and to apply them to broader and broader and broader sets of factual circumstances to justify more and more power over people and the power to prosecute and, and to control you uh, through that leverage. Really quickly before, um, Phil is about to run out the door and anybody who knows this channel, I really am trying to help every legal channel, especially newer ones. Um, if you guys haven't already, you can always click on Phil's name in the description and subscribe to it. He is quite literally on fire right now, um, blowing up like crazy. He was, what, a 745 two weeks ago when he came on? And he said, like, 14,000, 15,000 people are really <laughs> digging it. And, and while I'm on here, we also have both Norm and Mike, and they have a daily show. And, folks, we need to get them to over 1,000. There's yeah. uh, 1,291 <laughs> people here watching. If just over 50% of you guys consider subscribing to them, they're going to be over 1,000. Now, why is that important? Because 1,000 will put them on their way to becoming monetized. It gooses them up in the algorithm, and it really, really helps things out. So please consider subscribing. I'm definitely going to you know, try to plug it again later, but it helps a lot. I mean, these guys are donating a lot of their time. I mean, we're talking about Norm here, world famous. He's January 6th people, Proud Boys, um, Alex Jones. Some people know who that guy is. Um, what is uh, we all know who Alex Jones yeah. is. And, yeah. and, I, and I, I, even I go and watch their stuff. I'm in their chat, <laughs> chatting with them and everything. So their stuff is great. I, you know, I was, I was here the other day. So and yeah, Seif, you guys definitely got to uh, check it out. He, he represents Sife too, right? Yeah, Sife, yeah. Yo, we've talked Seif about Khan? If you yeah, have you interviewed Saif, yeah, I mean, we were in court just this weekend, Saif Khan, and First Amendment issues came up again. So the First Amendment is under attack in a courtroom near you. Find a lawyer to go defend it and raise some hell. You know, Absolutely. yeah, Saif Khan. Yeah. You know, in the chat, you'll just find it under Law Pod Daily. It should be in the description. Should be able to click it and go right there. And you know, if you want to subscribe here too, that would be awesome. It before, works. I just before, I just subscribe. But before Phil leaves, Phil. Yeah. Hey. I, I, I first, I'm such a huge fan of the, of the, the work you're doing down in Georgia. Oh, it is phenomenal. I've, I've been, I've been, I won't say stalking you, but I've been seeing like your Megyn Kelly interview and everything. It's, been, it's been crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm fanning out right now. But what are, what do you think about the appeal um, that's going on in Georgia? Because the judge is certified. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it before. I was left. talking with Ashley Merchant last night about this, and um, you know, she's the lawyer that. The Aaron Brockovich of the whole thing, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know, I because there's there's a parent. Okay, so the appeal, the, the judge said yes. He gave his blessing to do the uh, pretrial in, uh, interlocutory appeal for lawyers would know what that word means. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's now it's up to the 
court of appeals to agree. And so it's discretionary, but if, if one judge, it'll be assigned to a three judge panel. And if only one agrees, then they'll take it. So I think that this is the kind of issue that they really, they really need to take. Right. Because, and, and by the way, I did a whole uh, discussion about this on my channel. If anybody wants to go and listen to it. So they're <laughs> plugging myself. Uh, but no, if, if they will, if, if they will take it and I think they will, it's the kind of issue that's so important that, um, you, you would hate to have this gigantic trial that's going to last God knows how long just to find out after somebody's convicted and you take up the traditional appeal that no, the judge screwed it up, that we should have had a different prosecutor. So then you got to come back and do it all over again. Meanwhile, uh, some people perhaps are in prison or, or, or serving other types of sentences. So it makes sense to get it done pre-trial. And I think the court of appeals will do it. And by the way, they should grant, they, they should reverse judge McAfee because that was the most, um, to me, illogical opinion. <laughs> how do you, how do you say, okay, this, there's something rotten in Denmark, but we're only going to remove half of the stinky stuff. Okay. And so, um, just getting rid of Wade doesn't cure any of the taint uh, that, that probably because he's the one that was presenting the stuff to the grand jury and his work, his fingerprints are all over this case. So I don't think just removing him is enough. And the other big point about the appeal that I think may even be stronger than Willis and, and Wade stuff, you know, she went down to this church in South Atlanta and called Ashley Merchant and, and all, a lot of the defendants are racist. And, um, and you can't do that. You can't, disparage um you know defendants that you're actively prosecuting <laughs> in the well of a church while you're talking to potential jurors in fulton county who could be on the jury in the case <laughs> you just can't do it so it's um you know it's it was shameful and and she need, and the judge even said it was wrong but he didn't exact any penalty from her all he said was we might have to do a gag order <laughs> um so I don't want to see Fanny Willis wearing a gag, but I, <laughs> Nathan Wade might, but I, I, what I do want to see is I want to see the court of appeals uh, reverse this judge and exactly actually enforce some, some law and order on the prosecutor in this case. And by the way, Nate, thanks. That was great. I appreciate that. What you said, very kind words and Eric will, uh, he can, he can give you my number and we Phil, can, I want to feel, I want to play devil's advocate. Directly. So uh -oh. I, I looked at the, the forensic misconduct, you know, her speech at the AME church, and I thought, you know, she's got a right to run her mouth. I mean, it, it, you know, this isn't prejudicial pretrial publicity substantially likely to impair the fairness of the preceding trial some months out. So if I'm Fanny's lawyer and he issues a gag order, I'm saying this is protected speech under Nevada versus Gentile. It's sufficiently remote from the time of trial that I'm not buying it. How, how am I? And I and Mike was pushing hard at me this week on this, and I just wasn't seeing it, and I'm still yeah. having trouble seeing it. Well, she's she's got a right to say it. Sure, that's First Amendment. Nobody's stopping her from saying she can go say it. But if she says it, there's going to be a there's going to be a consequence, and the consequence is she's got to be removed from the case because it is that you can't just call somebody a racist. Uh, it, while you're talking to the jury pool, you just can't do it. Even the judge said it, it's wrong under our rules of ethics. He just, he just refused to do anything about it. So, um, That's I'm not saying cool. that she can't say it. She can go out there no, and, I hear you. I mean, there are preach it on the street corner all she wants. It's just that if she does that, she can't also prosecute them. Can I play devil's advocate? Because, um, I uh -oh. think Ian Corzine might've brought this up. I don't know. Is it possible that this, splitting the baby verdict or, or whatever decision side verdict <laughs> actually helps Trump because every time he goes out and deals with the case, he goes, yeah, the stupid corrupt DA from Atlanta. We all know it. Everybody knows that. Even MSNBC says that she's corrupt or that she's a liar, et cetera. So the longer it stays under her office, the more he can just keep pointing at it. A joke, yeah. joke, joke, I sucks. I don't stupid, think so. Joke. I don't think so. I think he's better off if she's tossed from the case because there's no other prosecutor who's going to pick it up. So if she's tossed, the case is over. So the best thing for Trump is to have the case over. And if she's out of the case, I believe it's going to be over. Right. Okay. I'm going to circle back to, um, I, I actually I gotta run everybody. A... Thank you very much thank for you. having me and nice Bill, to talk so to everybody. Trump. And uh, no, if anybody needs you, to Phil. find me, um, Eric can put me in touch. All right, perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, 
All right, this came in earlier. Nate's going through the super chats oh, right now, but yeah. no, no, that's cool. Um, I actually got invited onto an um, uh, Twitter Spaces yesterday, talking about something way out of my depth of the uh, federal budget, but um, that has stirred up some controversy. This super chat came in here a while, and let's just take one quick minute. What are your guys' thoughts on? I'm sure Joe has an opinion. Joe's here just in time. I really about I, trying to vacate uh, Speaker Johnson over the current uh, what do they call it? Swamp bus budget. What is it? A billion dollars a page? Yeah, that's that was my <laughs> observation. It's just over a billion dollars a page. Yeah. Wait a minute, I stymied Joe. Yeah, no. Yeah, it is just not hearing the wheels turning in here. Yeah, like he has the rant, and you just see her her going. uh... (laughs) 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 Note this time. (laughs) No, I I, well uh, before before we move there, I actually wanted to talk to Norm about about Gentile versus Nevada and his opinion and 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 his his take on that. Can I just explore that with him before we move on to? Before, is that okay? Is that okay? No. It's your show. Of course. It's your show. <laughs> Yo, when, when, the hell, when the hell have the conversations here been okay? It's like, Joe, all yeah. of a sudden, because Norm, Norm and Mike Have you been here, here before? Here. Have you been here before, Joe? Is this no, I'm just first time. Before, just before, time. before I, just, I just, no, because I, I, because frankly, I, I'm, I wasn't familiar with Gentile versus Nevada, and I think this is a really interesting topic. The point that he's making is that, you know, your freedom of speech should enable, should enable a prosecutor to do what she wants without you know that she is freedom of speech just like anyone else so but i'm i'm not really that familiar with that case can you can you can you go a little bit more into the holding of that case yeah, sure so gentile versus nevada was a, a a suspension order as to a lawyer i guess his name probably was gentile since it wasn't nevada but uh <laughs> you know <laughs> this unless it was nevada right you know that's lawyer i know i can't help myself please please it's friday please come sweet weekend you know um the um so there, an indictment is issued as to his client, and he gets on the courthouse steps and runs his mouth the way we have all done from time to time. And he impugns the integrity of the prosecution, comments on the credibility of witnesses, they're lying, and so forth. Um, the, a disciplinary proceeding is brought, and he is suspended. He brings it up. And I don't remember if it's 3.6 under the model rules, but there is a rule that says a trial, a lawyer and or trial participant um, cannot make prejudicial pretrial public um, um, uh, extra extrajudicial prejudicial pretrial comments substantially likely to impair the fairness of the proceedings. So he says, wait a minute, that's a little vague, you know, that's a little far out from the proceedings. Um, and it's a little and, and, and the Supreme Court in a split decision um, um, basically reversed the uh, the holding or uh, reversed the suspension and, and said that there were vagueness grounds in this. So this issue arose. I don't know if you followed the case in Connecticut. I can't say much more without getting sued. Uh, there was a missing mom case involving uh, a mother of five kids and a fellow named Fotis Dulos. I was his lawyer. And, he, you know, a judge issued a gag order as to me. And we took it up on Gentile versus uh, versus uh, Nevada. Um, and Mr. Dulos committed suicide on an emergency public interest appeal to the Connecticut Supreme Court. The client killed himself beforehand. We never got a ruling. But the point I would say, if I were Fa- Fawny's lawyer, excuse me, I don't want to call her Fanny, even though she she like, you know, even though even I, you know, I've never ass. seen I've never seen a doe with a fat, 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 fat posterior. But look, I, I she she. If I were Fawny's lawyer, part. I would say that she has the right to make that speech. I hear I hear your point about her doing so to the jury pool. Uh, but these are people who and maybe that maybe that decides it. But, you know, I think there's an imminence require built imminence requirement built into three point six one. And to say something months before trial to the public at large doesn't seem to satisfy it. And so I think if the court, you know, otherwise she's never going to be able to say anything about any trial participant. And maybe that's the way it should be. But if that's the case for her, it's the case for us as well. And I think we want to have robust speech in this country and be, and have the ability um, and have the ability to speak. So I think that Nevada versus Gentile, take a look at it. I think it I think it was decided in the 70s. It's the Supreme Court's most recent um, decision on uh, on on prejudicial pretrial speech and. Um, you know that that's as much as I can say. Well, well I, okay. So I, the question I, the question I want to ask you is: Is it not possible that the distinction between defense counsel and prosecution because absolutely. of the rights of the accused? 
So, yeah. you know, I would I would think that, and especially and given the context of the fact that this is the most, this is one of the most famous cases in the history of America. That, yeah, you're that, dead right. That the, that the timing, that the timing is less of, would become less of a factor in this particular circumstance. So those are two, I think, pretty, pretty significant distinctions between from from this case to Gentile versus State Bar of Nevada. So and, and Joe, right. just to yeah. jump in real quickly and add on to that, I think one of the things that factors into that with the distinction between the defense and the prosecution is that the defense is typically taking a responsive posture. They're not just coming out of the blue to provide information. They're having to respond to allegations that the prosecutor has made or that the state has made and, and has made public uh, about their client. Uh, and so there's a certain certain just evening, balancing of the scales that's going on with the defense response that you don't have with the prosecutor initiating these these types of statements. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you this much. I actually shared with with uh, Steve Sado uh, because uh, he actually responded to me and, and got back to me in DM thanking me for some compliments I said about him on X. So I said, look, I'm not going to be someone who's been bothering you all the time because because I, I, I don't want to I don't want to become that. But I do want to share with you a couple of thought, you know, a couple of things from time to time, just to potentially help you with your defense. And for those of you who aren't aware, he's he's Trump's defense counsel in in the Georgia Rico case. And I shared with him Phil Holloway's post where he had a 17 minute montage of dozens of different preachers getting up praising Saint Fawny as being like this, you know, as being this this woman who's being oppressed and she's being assailed by the by the media because she's a black woman and and by these racist by you know by these by by a racist president and it's just like it and they took her comments. It's not simply what she said, but we can see the repercussions reverberating particularly throughout the black community of Fulton County and, and perhaps around Around the country, which is less impactful with respect to around the country is less impactful with respect to to the impact on this case. But still, to the extent that it's reverberating through black churches throughout Fulton County, it's not simply a chance that this had an impact on Donald Trump. It's almost it's almost irresponsible to suggest it has not had an impact. That's a great points, but 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 I but I, I do want to but but can I I do want to push back on that point is that. All those black churches, I don't think they were saying Trump was not a racist before, before, like, you know, it's like down there. That, isn't that he's the, been pitted as being though, him. That he yeah, I know, but she pitted it as it's me, me personally oh, okay, versus I him. I understand what you're saying now. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and then like, he's coming after me now. So it's, it, and it's it, they're painting it as, as if this is an exhibition of proof that he's a racist. He is the racist. All right. Got well, it, yeah. and it, is it possible that, that that would still be okay, but for the virality of the moment in the trial, right? The response, the coverage, the wise. Because I think that, Joe, you were just saying that this is one of the biggest trials in, in modern history, right? Every <laughs> aspect of the trial is being reported on daily right almost hourly so mm -hmm. to the extent that those those out of court those extrajudicial statements would have otherwise been okay as adjudicated there's still a it, it seems like we're in a different moment here with technology social media and then the way the news cycle runs that the response to everything trump related especially with respect to the various trials that he's he's enduring right now that to me takes this into a category all its own right Correct, michael and to take it one step further this was foreseeable. The fact that it would reverberate right. this way yeah, yeah. was right. foreseeable, which is why she should be held accountable for this. It's almost an intuitive thing. We're talking about forensic misconduct. And so I think my my inability to convince Norm one on one is, is I think, related to really the age difference. Right. My my intuition. The fact that you're 34, that I'm twice as old as you and, <laughs> well, and six are, times are, wiser. That are may be a factor. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ageism. Ageism in the midst. Yeah. Hey, I agree look, with I'm, Norman. I'm not 60. <laughs> I may be half dead, but I'm still fully alive, right? Yeah. Actually, Actually uh, Mike, why don't you go, you go and repeat, repeat that again now? No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Let me tune it up. <laughs> tune it up for justice. No, that's. But I think there's something intuitive about it, right? There's something intuitive for those that are, are are just surreally online, I guess, as we would say, that know that every aspect of this, every grain of sand falling through that hourglass that related to Trump is being reported on in some way. To the extent there was already some notion that this prosecution was politically motivated, and then for there to be extrajudicial comments in the from the pulpit from the from the lead prosecutor who was already under scrutiny as it was to make such statements about him being a racist, et cetera. And, and again, the politically motivated part of this is, is to do 
with the election, the forthcoming election. Right. So all of this has a much broader context to say that what it, what is that? What are those statements really designed to do? Right. And is it necessarily designed to uh, afford him some level of guilt or is this more about hardening voter bases that may otherwise be convinced that there's something up with his prosecution? Right. To, to translate in the ballot box. Exactly. Ultimately. Yeah. yeah. But the, what, but she was disqualified for something close to this before. Remember, she had done the the um, the campaign fundraiser for the opponent of the state senator. So for those of you who don't, for those in the chat doesn't know, Fani was disqualified from prosecuting a state senator in this case or even investigating it because she had done a fundraiser for the Democratic guy. And um, and the judge was like, well, that's too much of, a, of, an, of an appearance. So they, they they booted the case to another thing. But could, but I think the argument could be made based on that and the fact that moving forward that now you have this other thing where she's influencing not only the election, but even this case, that may it, it may just compound the fact that she made this is the reason why she should be removed for these statements. I put a poll up so that way the um, the audience or the experts can determine essentially, hopefully I worded it right, but um, <clears throat> do you feel like she should be allowed to go spout everything off in churches, you know, as free speech, like a lawyer on the courthouse steps? or not so maybe i worded it wrong but that's kind of the way i as a non-lawyer interpreted this discussion well i think you got to give credit to andrea because she raised the critical distinction and that is lawyers can bark within the context of what the prosecution says in order to rebut that but the prosecution really can't start a firestorm so i you know maybe tweak the question a bit because she, she has special obligations as a prosecutor that was a great point that andrea raised and norm you've said before that that you took issue with her uh, unwillingness, her seeming unwillingness to simply step away from the case for the integrity of the office and for the integrity of the prosecution itself, right? And so there is a level of discretion here that I think is is ripe for for criticism on top of what we're talking about from a legal perspective, right? You know, what what is her duty to the profession and to the office that she represents long term, right? Blind ambition. Well, I mean, I guess wasn't that James D or not? Uh, oh. Dean uh, from the Watergate area. Didn't he write a book? Uh, on John blind Dean. ambition. John Dean. Yeah. Uh -oh. um, I think that's going to be her biography if there's not, if the title's available. You know, <laughs> I mean, she wants to go somewhere when she gets there. I hope she forgets mm. about the rest of us and it's on another mm. path. By the way, it's the 50th anniversary of uh, Watergate this year, folks. Holy cow. Oh, wow. Mm. Yep, in August. 50 what you what, oh, wow, Nate. You weren't even you weren't even. Born. I wasn't born, but I'm thinking like, wow, 50 <laughs> years. Eh? Hey, I was born and so was Joe. He doesn't like to claim it, but. No, I, I owe my age. I just say we're not qualified as, as Gen X. I just, I born, he was like, there. <laughs> <laughs> as a baby <laughs> we were four four years old we were hanging out and playing okay so what else do we have oh i wanted to jump to andrea while we have you here um what are your thoughts and this is going right into pop culture what are your thoughts on the whole dan wooten apology uh with johnny <laughs> depp and what's going on there i'm sorry Apology? <laughs> it, it, it felt apology? A little... Did I miss something? <laughs> well, you, you know, the issue is obviously Dan Wooten is trying to rehabilitate himself from the fallout of accusations of his own that, that have been made against him by uh, other employees uh, of the, the Sun. Um, and so he, he lost his job as a result of all that. He's now trying to launch his, his independent, uh, you know, media entity, whatever you want to, whatever he you want to call it. Owens. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he's, you know, now, been by the way, spoiler the alert, I want, I represented Candace Owen, Owens when she was a high school student, but we can talk about that later. Oh, oh, oh the, 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 the social the autopsy case. or the governor thing, the governor thing. Oh, oh. cool. Uh, I got a lot to talk to Norma about. <laughs> yes, she was just talking about that on the Breakfast Club yesterday. So, so this is all your fault. That's what you're telling me. No, I shut up. I just had to throw that out there. I'm sorry, Andrea. You know, it's, it's oh no, no it's worries. Old, it's old white male privilege. We run, you know, when, oh, when the damn when you, the tomb, Norm, damn you. When the tomb back and you get as old as me, you got to get it out before you're done. You know, six semper tyrannis. The patriarchy will rise again. Yeah, septuagenarians unite. You have nothing to use, lose but your lives. I'm not there yet, but I'm close. Yeah. Uh. Well, anyway, so so Dan Wooten is trying to rehabilitate himself because he's been me too in the same way that he me too Johnny Depp and, uh, you know, went to trial in the UK over it, won a judgment, 
uh, based on a, a defense of truth. And uh, now he is coming out because we subsequently had a trial in Fairfax that, you know, millions of people around the world watch, saw crystal clear Amber Heard is a lying psychopath. And, <laughs> mm. uh, you know, the, these allegations against Johnny Depp are, are just ridiculous. I mean, entirely unfounded, unsupported by any type of evidence for her own contradictory claims. I mean, you know, you, you guys that watched it, you know, the story. Uh, so he's trying to, I think, rehabilitate himself by associating himself with Johnny Depp having been wrongfully accused to be able to suggest he himself was the victim of a similar type of, of conspiracy, a similar type of smear hoax, if you will. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that he can't go all the way to saying, well, yeah, we all know Amber Heard lied, right? Because that could have the potential downstream consequence of undoing the UK judgment, giving giving Johnny Depp grounds to be able to go back to the UK, say there is this new evidence from the other party himself admitting that he knows these allegations aren't true after having relied on a defense of truth. So he, he clearly doesn't want to disturb <clears throat> that judgment. So he, it basically, you know, apology. He didn't really apologize for anything other than, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I'm sorry that you I'm sorry that you had a bad relationship. You know, he, he takes no responsibility for his role uh, in, you know, promoting those those accusations in sending them out in, into the world and accepting Amber Heard's claims without uh, any type of corroboration or investigation. So, you know, frankly, it, it fell a bit flat, a bit flat. But at least from a legal standpoint, I see him walking that tightrope. That's exactly why he did it the way he did. While we're walking tightropes, and I've still got you here on the subject, maybe you can help me understand something, which is drama. In the background, really doing this? it appears. Of course we're doing this, Kurt. Okay. You like drama. Right, I, I know you're no, the I really drama don't, I'm going to do it just for you, because you All love right, it. Um, Adam Waldman versus Brown Rudnick. What in the hell is going on on a case that, to me, was settled forever ago? It, it's like there's this weird bickering that's happening. Can somebody explain that to me? Well, uh, Eric, I think there's a lot of things that are going into that, but I think part of the issue with what's being characterized as the drama is that there was a community uh, of people who supported Johnny Depp and believed in his, his innocence long before Johnny Depp showed up in Fairfax and started winning, and then the rest of the world came along and, and got on board with that. So there's kind of some old business that's tied up with uh, what people are characterizing as the drama. Adam Waldman's role in that. Um, it's really funny that Norm has, has brought up uh, <laughs> Gentile versus Nevada today uh, because, as we know, Adam Waldman was removed as Johnny Depp's counsel in Virginia on the basis of public statements that he had made uh, about the case. And... What you'll find remarkably absent from any of the defense of Adam Waldman's statements is a, a vigorous uh, advocacy for his First Amendment right to speak. Uh, bad lawyering, bad lawyering. Shame on them. E e yeah, I mean, it just just completely, um, completely left to the wayside. So, you know, uh, I've been putting together my thoughts about what to say about this situation uh, because I have, you know, perhaps unwittingly found myself somewhat involved in it, um, despite <laughs> trying to really not say much about it at all. But uh, there are some concerns, I think, that the people who have been in this community for a long term have because, like I said, they weren't just there when Johnny Depp started to win. They were there when Johnny Depp was losing. And so they've got serious concerns about how was that allowed to happen? Uh, why, why has that then, you know, not been dealt with in the, the public rehabilitation of, of Johnny Depp and, and his reputation? It left this door open to where here we are, you know, two, two years from the trial and we're still getting all of these podcasts, all of these hit pieces, all of these smear campaigns that we're seeing, you know, podcasts, Netflix, 
uh, all of these things that are that are really undermining Johnny Depp's innocence. And so people have questions about that, why that happened, how that happened. Uh, and those are things that I think they are wanting to investigate to try to sort out and make sense of kind of the, the bigger part of this story that's led us to where we are today. What do you speculate is the reason that Netflix and all these different media are are motivated to defend the Amber this hard? Because it is it is if you think about it. I mean, look, we all me too. Many, many of us subscribe. Yes, many of us subscribe too. to the Unit Party and 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 or or perspectives as far as how the left is running the media. I think that's it's pretty irrefutable. But even with the left running the media, this seems to be a sacred cow that they they don't want to let die. And it's it's weird that she has not been kicked to the annals of history and instead seems to have these people who are desperate to to continue defending her despite how transparently uh, charlatan her claims were mm -hmm. from the get-go. And I'm, I'm wondering why it is that they don't just like move on to the next hero victim that they can and are so dead set on defending her individually did, did because you, her I case think. destroyed the entire movement i mean seriously me too was swallowing everything in my opinion like a, a hurricane coming down the coast and this case was so large and got so much airtime and flipped the narrative completely on its head that they're trying to unravel it because it was Again, in my opinion, a time where an accusation automatically was reality, no matter what happened. And that has been pushed back because of the Johnny Depp verdict. Nothing had pushed it back like it before. Now there's this giant case, a giant settlement with giant names that people can point out and say, just like that, just like that, over and over and over. So they want to destroy the just like that. Mm. I, I, I certainly agree that that's the case. Um, it's part of the post-truth society narrative. The, the you know, uh, concern, the ability that the media has to get people to believe stuff that is patently untrue, you know, against their own eyes. This has been kind of a, a very significant case from, from my perspective in that the public has refused by and large, to be gaslit about what they saw for themselves unfolding in that courtroom in Virginia. But there's also, I mean, Joe, you asked me to speculate. There, There is a question about who is it? Who is it that's doing this? Why are they doing this? Uh, you want me to speculate. And the reason why this gets into then the nexus between Adam Waldman and Brown Rudnick is because the nexus that people are interested in is Elon Musk. Elon mm, Musk mm. had a role in this case. He was an eyewitness to Amber Heard. He was in communications with her in the days immediately following the, the May 21st, 2016 incident when she claimed Johnny Depp threw a phone in her face and she had all these bruises and injuries and so forth. He was a material witness. He was subpoenaed, I believe, six times in total by uh, Brown Rudnick over the course of the investigation, but he was never served and his deposition was never taken. People have questions about how and why that was allowed to, to take to take place, given obviously his significance just as a public figure and the type of power that he has in directing these kinds of narratives. Uh, but he 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 was there. He would have personal knowledge of things, um, and, and so how somebody like that could just be allowed to slip through the the cracks? People have questions about could, that. Could could that be? But that. Could that have been like a decision because, in other words, we may have enough and this guy's a wild card. We don't want, like, if, God forbid he says the wrong thing. It could really hurt the case. So could that have been like a decision Elon to say, we just don't want him? Thing? I no. think there's, 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 two, there's two issues with that, Nate. One is that um, you, you would say the same thing about all of the defense witnesses. You would say the same thing about Rocky Pennington. You would say the same thing about Josh Drew. You know, her friends that were there were part, that were part of the hoax. Uh, if you're... If your strategy for preparing for trial is to stick your head in the sand and not know what they're going to say, then then you would certainly avo avoid deposing deposing those people as well. Uh, respectfully, so Andrea. That that's respectfully, Andrea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to push back on that. They yeah. specifically use deposition testimony for Rocky, and I believe for Josh as well. 
So it's not like there was any, there was no risk that they were going to get something they didn't know was going to come out there, like like they were talking about with Elon. And perhaps they could have done the same thing with Elon and get and get his deposition testimony in there. In fact, and, it would and, have to be deposition testimony because they don't have a mechanism in Virginia to compel an out of state witness to appear mm, at trial. They can yeah. only compel a deposition. Which and must, remember, in the days coming up to the to the trial. Uh, Elon Musk was on Amber Heard's witness list. There was all this speculation that he was going to show up and testify. So now, how Andrea, unprepared are you going to be if he actually shows up voluntarily and you haven't even taken his deposition? But so they, is, they didn't know that, you know, one way or another that, 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 that was Both was sides go decided not to call him, which means that Elon at the deposition almost certainly was the wild card that we're all speculating. That in certain ways he was helping yeah. Amber and in certain ways he was hurting Amber and each side was afraid of the gamble. That's the most likely conclusion. Because if he was helpful to either side. Situation here as to, because otherwise you're, we're correct. One of them, one side would have said, oh, wow, we got to get Elon up there on the stand. And both sides said, no, we're not going to use deposition <laughs> testimony. We're not going to use any of this. We don't Never want any mind. of this because they were afraid <laughs> that the jury will take a position based on his testimony that was against their clients. So I think that he likely did what Elon often does, which is that he's sort of a little confusing in the way he's, he's phrasing things. And you can interpret it in multiple different ways. And when they watched it, they probably had their, their, their mock jury you know, come out with different results or, or results that were concerning to them. And that's why I think that he, we didn't end up seeing any of his tests. I think that's, that's the only possible, that's, Elon the, that's Musk, certainly the most likely conclusion. He was never deposed. That's the problem. He oh. was never, never deposed. Never, never, never so deposed. nobody knows you said what there he was would six, say. You said there were, I thought you said there were six. They uh, issued six uh, deposition uh, subpoenas that they never served. Oh. They oh. never served. So okay. this, I misunderstood you. I apologize. Not only does that. I apologize. Does that kind of undermine this theory that they that they, you know, didn't have a strategy to talk to him because they were at least ostensibly trying to talk to him throughout the entire pendency of the case, but they just never took the steps that needed to be to be taken to make that happen, and I, I just want to go to on on this. Andrea, before this... you move, I wanted to ask a question. Something you said shocked me. I, is, I thought there was an interstate compact on the production of necessary and material witnesses. Um, that all states were a, a signer to. And thus, if Virginia wanted somebody, they'd have to persuade a trial judge that they needed them. Uh, they would then go to the, host, the, the the receiving state and they'd have to persuade a trial judge to get that person under subpoena. There'd be a show cause hearing. The guy could say, I don't want to go for any number of reasons. And I thought you could compel interstate process under that. Are you saying Virginia is not part of that process? So that is um, for criminal cases. There are criminal right. yeah, processes okay, right. to enough. be able to, right. to compel I betray my roots. I betray yes. my roots. Yeah. So in, in okay. civil, there is not. And uh, okay. Virginia is part of the interstate compact for um, the, the, I forget exactly what it is, but it's basically civil depositions and, and civil subpoena. There are okay. processes okay. that you can go through. One of the um, sticky pieces in this whole situation is that uh, approximately, I think a year and a half after uh, Brown Rudnick first started trying ostensibly to subpoena Elon Musk, uh, Elon ostensibly moved to Texas. Texas is not a party to this interstate compact for civil really? discovery. And Texas also has limitations, severe limitations on your ability to uh, employ alternative service. So mm. that, you know, would potentially make it difficult to, you know, more difficult mm. to serve Elon Musk in Texas than it would be in somewhere like California, where if he's trying to evade, well, then you can just, you know, find an alternative mechanism to serve him that's that's acceptable to the court. Um, so the, the thing I want to push back on, though, is is just this this theory of how depositions are used and, and this idea that, um, you know, it, it would be it would be damaging to the case with with what he came out with and so forth. Uh, that is the nature of, of investigation. There's always a risk that a, a witness is going to lie to you. But good lawyers, good litigators, you see that as an opportunity. That is not a threat. There would be nothing better for the case than being able to prove Elon Musk lying on, on behalf of Amber Heard and, and helping her to, you know, essentially perpetrate this, this hoax. That feeds into your theory of the case. So... Uh, I just I have a lot of reasons why I'm very, very skeptical of what's being floated now is this kind of novel perspective that well, bit Brown Rudnick never had a strategy of, of pursuing Elon Musk because it, it could have been dangerous. It's simply undermined by their own actions in the case of trying mm -hmm. to subpoena him virtually up to the point of trial.
Mm-hmm. I'm going to well, jump in that, really if quickly. If that's true, then why they never actually serve it on them? That's that's the part. That that's what people me. would like to know. The, the the Dan Wooten thing, though. The the one thing about Dan Wooten's apology that I will say is that I think, and I'm going to disagree with. I, I'm, I'm hope I I hate to disagree with the panel, but I think him, no, you don't him initially. We right don't. Him, <laughs> your reception is suddenly gone. <laughs> We've lost Nate, the lawyer. This is not big state. This is not the deep state. This is Alex Jones talking. Nate, the lawyer has been swallowed by a space alien. A gay frog has suddenly <laughs> consumed his essence, and he's now been flatulated. That's right, flatulated out in a, in a parallel universe controlled by teenagers who control us all as avatars. This is Alex Jones by my miracle boner grow, and you too can <laughs> <laughs> okay, excuse me. I I digressed. I try, I'll behave now. Mike told me to try to be on my best behavior. This is it. This is your best. Is it, is it really? The, the, by the way, the folks, one thing, if you want to check out more of this, they just hit 500 <laughs> subscribers. Oh, wow. Uh, let's Come see on, if we, hey, we got, my we got to be able to get for years. Uh, Gee. We, we can get we can get them up to uh Get them up to a thousand. I'm and sure. Somebody put the link in the chat so people because people are lazy. So people need a link in the chat so they can just click on that link and go into. The store. I, I, I did drop it in the chat. Click yes. on my avatar. But so. one thing, one thing I, I think because there's a lot of people who are who are who are saying Dan Wooten should have never written the article. I disagree. I think if if you have a celebrity whose wife comes to you and says this happened, I'm a first person, then you write the article. I think the issue with Dan Wooten was his advocacy. For getting di- for getting Johnny fired from all of his jobs and all of his employment and going to J.K. Rollins and saying you hired a blank beater and all that type of stuff. That's the issue, and I think that's what Don Wooten has the issue that he's got now is that the same thing happened to him in which he was fired just off these allegations. I, I think any journalist or anybody who has this first person, you know, their wife saying this happened to me from this person would write that story and would be protected under free speech to write it because you do you have the the person who's saying this happened to me now whether it was true or not is a whole different story but i think him writing the story i don't think that was a problem and i think even though i understand it, it had those negative consequences for johnny depp but I, I don't think you can avoid that though well, hold on did he just write a story which obviously is journalistically there or was he an activist that's and what there i'm saying is, he, well, he, he, he was an difference. activist he was an activist he was, he was specifically putting yes. words in jk rowling's mouth that she had never used jk rowling was never a believe all women advocate i would yeah. challenge anybody Especially to go trans. back for jk rowling statements <laughs> oh, and find forever taking that that type of position so he put those words in her mouth to then shoot them down and and suggest that she's a hypocrite because she's continuing to to support Johnny Depp having a role in the Fantastic Beasts franchise and, you know, specifically calling for him to be removed from that franchise. So this really wasn't just a, I'm reporting the the allegations, I'm reporting the facts. Uh, He he is clearly taking a position and, and arguing for action to be taken on the basis of it. All right, well, I'm going to jump again in uh, La Pod Daily. They've got a few more subs that have come in, 520. And this is the kind of material you will find on their channel. I'm going to put uh, Mike and Norm on the spot to discuss the important case of the roommate who shot another roommate over cats. All right, before, <laughs> before you do that, I actually have to run. It was great meeting everyone. It's, it's great meeting Norm and Mike. Great meeting you, Nate. Guys. Great meeting Mike. Joe, I hate you. I'm civil law. You're my brother. Andrea is. is like, What's oh your name God. again? <laughs> it's, it's oh, you know, and uh, Andre, you got you got to come around more often. This is like ridiculous. We, we, we every time we see you, like once in every two years. Come on, no you know? come around. But listen, guys, thank you guys for for having me. I will see you guys next week because I'm, I'm I'm here all the time. So see you guys right. next week. Hey, see you. Thank you, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. So that's, right. it's, it's, this Florida case raises the age old question, and I don't want to be too blunt because I'm just meeting Andrea. Can you get too much feline? Okay. You know, and you know, you might know what the synonym for that is. And I guess the answer is yes. So apparently some guy gets tossed from his home. He's got three cats and somebody takes him in. It's and a Florida, man. Every- Florida man. Florida man. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a Florida thing. Maybe too much. Three cats is too many. Know. You know, and so, yeah, that, that, that may be, but you bring the guy in, he's got three, then he's got four, then he's got five. And it, at some point, Noah's Ark closed the door and said, there ain't going to be no more cats in here. And words got hot. And before you know it, somebody got popped. I love the case Poet. because this is an insight into the world of street level criminal defense lawyers. If you're mm-hmm. hanging a shing- shingle out and you got your phone number out there and said, you know, when the heat is on, call me and it'll be cool. It's not. It's freaking crazy out here. And so what story can this guy give that potentially just the cat did it? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah I, and so, right. you know, I mean, clearly the case calls out for a competency examination of some sort um, or, you know, or maybe if not competency, uh, you know, an insanity defense, because, you know, what sort of a primitive attachment do you have to the animals that such when a person says you can't bring another stray into the house, you decide, my gosh, killing is a good idea. I it blows me away. I mean, no pun intended. Um, you know, I've done a, a, <laughs> any needed, number we to, of we needed to feed the we need to feed the cats somehow and here's some fresh. All bread. puns should be intended, by the way. Well, the fact a, after me, storm, more murder storm. cases than you know, we, we we've got blood knee deep in this office from all the murder cases and no two murderers are alike. I, I you know, credit credit to Anna, you know, to Leo Tolstoy. You know, all happy families are alike. Every murder is different. Um, and there's always some crazy private quotidian motive um, that triggers somebody. And in an instant, they go from zero to 60. So here's my theory of criminal law. Why do people like to file high profile criminal cases? Because we're all criminals at heart. And we all have these savage impulses for control and whatnot. Um, and we get pissed when a criminal does it because they got away with what we wish we do. So when Freud wrote Civilization and Discontent, he said, you know, it takes a lot of work to control. I see good lawyer Joe saying, where'd you find this whack dude? will put him back. You know, but I mean, you know, but I, I think there's something to it because murder is so awful. If you've defended one, you know, somebody's dead. The guy who did it, his life is about to end. But the public loves reading about this. Why? And here we are talking about a guy who killed over cats. It's just I don't know. It's a crazy world. Well, Texas, we always have the guy needed killing defense, so that works. Well, how about yeah, yeah? How would you apply that? Yeah, okay, so killing, except it didn't work, right? So, th so this reminds me of our uh, conversation with Luann Rice from way back, Norm. I really, oh, yeah. maybe we'll, we'll plug that later. But the facts here. So, Lee County, Florida. This is what struck me, and this is, I think, what strikes this as sort of a competency issue uh, or fitness to stand trial. Is yeah, th this gentleman was evicted from his home, so he clearly he was he was already in sort of some sort of financial duress. He was invited into this woman's home and began staying there but he brought three cats with him but each success Check your dating day, app don't bring this guy in right yeah. but each successive day he was there he added a cat so day day one he's got three day two four day three five this sounds like a bad four, grim fairy tale right it sounds then, like the prince is about to wake up and figure out how the pee is way under the mattresses somewhere and then at the point where this he, is going right yeah and then at the point that the homeowner says all right no these got to go outside it wasn't they got to go completely. It was, look, there's too many cats in here. They need to live outside. Mm. He retrieves a 40 caliber handgun from whatever belongings he brought with him from his evicted situation and then shoots her 10 times. 10 times for each cat. I mean, there must be, you know, you know, I mean, that that there's some poetic justice there. I guess know? he's missing 44 shots there. But anyway, yeah. So she lives to tell the tale. And but what was interesting to me and what I think drew the criticism about competency and perhaps, you know, his fitness to stand trial was the fact that she was reaching for her phone to dial 911 and he knocked it out of her hands and was going to let her bleed out and then suddenly regain some sense of of self and, and goodness, I guess, and allowed her to dial 911 to call. Uh, call for help. Oh, how gallant. You know, it was the first date that was a little rocky. And his name in in in, in, in the joint is going to be Sure Shot. You were point blank and you shot her <laughs> 10 times and she still lived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's bad. That's Brad Ratio, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you hit the target a lot, I guess. So so speaking of um, all murders are different, uh, I don't know. Is anybody following the Richard Allen murder, the, that case uh, over, a little bit. over I was in Indiana? It on, I was following in the appeals. That was fun. Yeah, it's it's been it's been absolutely crazy. So the, the thing that has come out this week, there was a hearing uh, on Wednesday and um, apparently the state has lost 70 of the interviews that they did for like uh, extent. Uh, little bit over a month period uh, back in 2017. So there was a defense motion to compel and to dismiss on the basis of 70, 70 interviews that are just now gone, just vanished into the internet. Mere ministerial error. They, 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 they were escaped from the filing cabinet? The, the, so the the story is that these were um, these were video recorded uh, video recorded interviews of, of witnesses and at some point, somebody somehow reset the settings on the DVR machine so that it was continuously recording. And then it recorded over all of these interviews for this, this length of time. Now, uh, Great. 
Like yeah, but the thing that's really disturbing about all of this is because I don't know if anybody remembers the Franks motion that was filed in the case by the defense, where mm -hmm. the argument is that when they were initially investigating this case, uh, it's the murders of these these two young girls uh, that were found on on a bridge uh, in, in uh, this place called Delphi, Indiana, and uh, there were indications of some type of ritualistic behavior like these tree limbs that were arranged in a, in a particular way and, and things like that and so oh, there was, oh you gotta love indian no plays indianus right you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so there was originally uh police and were investigating a connection with this um uh pagan branch uh odinism, uh, odinism. or something odinism, yes yeah. the, the, the odinists uh and they have um you know found, you know, apparent connections between the, the staging of the crime scene and these Odinist practices. Well, what's peculiar then is that they have also identified law enforcement officers, people in the Department of Corrections who are, uh, you know, handling Richard Allen. They're there guarding him in prison who are members of this Odinist Ooh. sect. You think you so think someone you think someone deliberately create... did it on the prosecution side? Someone's deliberately Interfering with the evidence? I love Potentially it. a law enforcement um, type mm. of involvement there or, or somebody who would be known to law, law enforcement. Uh, and then, you know, the, the defense theory is basically that Mr. Allen has been, he's been set up as the patsy. Yeah. Uh, well, Good luck 70, with that. 70 <laughs> interviews going bye-bye raises all kinds of problems doesn't that raise quite a lot of questions for you about how, how could anybody possibly have a fair trial under these types of circumstances where such a significant amount of evidence is, is just gone i mean this is this is kind of brady on steroids you can't so but it's you also just the or you get, of the you brady doctrine because how do you prove that that anything in any of those interviews was was exculpatory brady only applies to exculpatory evidence so if you just you know erase it all and nobody ever knows what it was, then I guess you get I'm away. I'm pretty with sure it. that's not. I'm pretty sure that's not what Brady had in mind. <laughs> well, well, I think so. Be... Did they get an adverse inference then? Is that the solution? You know, that's you can... at the very yeah, least, that. right? Yeah, there should yeah, be. You would think that. that justice would demand that there should be at least mm -hmm. an adverse interest. That there's an assumption that if 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 you've been that sloppy. That there, would, would, that there was a willfulness behind the sloppiness. You would hope that there would at least be something like that. Now, as as Kurt remembers from the appeal in this case, uh, there are some kind of significant issues with the judge as well. Uh, and part of, part of what's crack. alarming about all of this is <laughs> the lengths that they are going to keep this from the public eye. So an order was apparently just entered this morning. They're not going to allow cameras in for, for this trial. Uh, the trial is set to start in May. So they, they want this courtroom closed. Uh, there have been orders Shocking. that certain of these hearings, like this hearing that was just held on, on Wednesday, that there's not going to be any transcript prepared for this hearing. None, none of this stuff it is going, you know, the public record is not going to be available. There are, are so we many sure we're not in Baton Rouge with the process here. <laughs> are, we, are we sure this crime didn't happen in Baton Rouge and this is the Baton Rouge court system? Because that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Well, like Speaking so it's. It's wild. It's 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 quite wild how, how all this is happening. But but the concern, you know, that I would have as a defense attorney isn't just, OK, well, I get an adverse inference and, and the jury can can, you know, potentially hold that against the state. It's that these are investigative leads that are lost. If they investigated somebody who had information uh, that, that could be consistent with the defense theory, uh, I don't have any way to follow up on that. I don't have any way to develop that uh, on my own because, you know, it's it's gone now. No, nobody knows what it was. So the ability to develop an exculpatory theory is significantly damaged by th this type of just, I mean, I guess at best it's negligence. Hmm. I've had a super chat sitting in here for a while from uh, Sean, potentially criminal, who's been on here many times. And uh, um, does Norm have any thoughts on the Michelle Traconis verdict? I covered the trial and the state's case was very thin to me. 
Yeah, I've got a gazillion thoughts on it, but I'd be charged two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per thought under a lawsuit that was filed to keep me quiet. So I'm I'm barred from talking. Ooh. Okay. About well, okay. Sorry. Well, speaking. Of, well, Andrea was just talking about bad judges. Can we have a discussion about? Well, super chats is what that translates to, right? <laughs> <laughs> He'll fund it. We'll, we'll fund that. I am curious we... if the panel has any thoughts about justice, diversity hires, perspective, and concerns about the First Amendment hamstringing the United the the government. The, you guys in the heard, case that was just argued at the Supreme Court. The, the case that was just argued in Murthy in Murthy versus uh, versus yeah. uh, versus Missouri. This is this is was originally you know Missouri v. Yeah. Biden that the Supreme Court that Justice Katanji Brown Jackson mm. expressed concern during oral arguments mm. that did, yes. that the that the state of Missouri's position might serve to hamstring. Use the First Amendment to hamstring the United States government. In time. Well, let me yeah, channel. It's like I, 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 at, the, at, the risk of pointing out, at the risk of pointing out the obvious, that is the goal. It, <laughs> yes, you are correct. The First Amendment hamstrings the government. You are 100% correct on the money. Help me understand, Counsel, your view of these amendments. Are you saying they impose substantive limits on what the government can do to the I people? Am in fact is that your that view of the first? Uh, of the, I am of the saying, of right? in fact, it imposes limits. It, it, it explicitly prevents the government from doing things. Yes, but what if we is, need fact, to have them done in the name of safety, security, justice, diversity, or any other good thing that pops out? I'd like of the to just point vaguely morning. directionally in the the direction of the Constitution, the thing that y'all swore to uphold, if you remember that that thing. But but okay. it doesn't read itself. I mean, it's it's not a suicide pact, wouldn't you agree? And if it's required in the interest of justice, or in the interest of global warming, or in the interest of the cause of the day, <laughs> shouldn't we be able to override this ana anachronistic thing? And Only why is if you that hand of history on our living hearts? You have to. Call I'm a member of the Supreme thing. Court bar. If it comes down to it, do you think I could challenge them to a fight, or do you think that's too much? <laughs> yeah, I'll see you there. I am too. You know, we had a near miss on a cert grant. I would I filed one of three petitions. They granted cert on somebody else's how how offended Aww. was i you know we were first in and they went to some experienced supreme court litigator i i guess i've dropped the f-bomb too many times but it had to do with obstruction of justice in the 1512 j6 cases um and whether that statute was intended to apply to rioters or merely to obstructing justice but as to katanji i want to Sing a little song for your listeners, all right? Mm. There was a justice had a name. Katanji was her name. Oh, K-T-N-G-I, K-T-N-G-I. Now, that's so bad. Once you've heard it, you can't unhear it. And so I've <laughs> burdened you with some of my verbal flatulence, and you'll have to deal with this now for the rest of your life. No apologies necessary. But, by it. the way, Norm actually is going on tour as a comedian. It's his second mm. career. Cases law thing doesn't work out well for him. I'm actually yeah. working on my first Supreme Court petition, so uh, I'm excited about that yeah they're fun we we're, well, we're filing one for owen schroyer next week i think i filed three or four last year I, I gave up for a while because we've been my firm's been there twice and you know the first time was when i was out of law school for about four years and i thought oh this is cool everybody goes to the supreme court and then it took about another 15 yeah. and now i'm trying again but you know you never know what do you what's your issue uh, it's a deals with a veteran who was improperly fired by their company. So we're arguing a violation of uh, the Uniform Services Employment Act. Huh. Cool. Have you have you talked to Eric Gang at all about any of this? Do you know who he is? He's a no, pretty good haven't. veterans lawyer. But anyhow, we'll talk later. Joe. All right, um, Joe. I'm, uh, well, oh. just quickly. Sorry, Eric. I was going to say yeah. that you know we talk about on uh, on Law Pod Daily quite a lot about the emergence of the public health state. That's something that Norm, in particular, is pretty uh, preoccupied with. But on the topic of Kentaji Brown Jackson and her uh, line of questioning, her being worried about uh, the First Amendment potentially hamstringing the government. One thing that I pointed to on a recent stream was, if, if we recall, and I can't remember the case, and so excuse me for this, but Justice Sotomayor. Uh, talking about erroneous facts related to the deaths of children during COVID. 80 million children are in hospitals because of, because of a pandemic. <laughs> so it, it's, it, for that reason, it's impossible for me to, to have those two things ex exist in isolation and not think that they're somehow related when you have language around this. It worries me. It worries because this is related to COVID. All of the, the censorship model was related to COVID. There were the lockdown policies, et cetera. But we have we have on the record, there's something that we could actually reference back to where these sorts of issues are it, make it obvious that the Supreme Court is not impervious to those sorts of like, uh, I guess, weaponized facts or those sorts of issues that can matriculate mm. into the case itself. So that really is what's concerning about the interpretation of the First Amendment and under the regime 
that the Biden administration had enacted, the pressure that they put on social media companies and stuff like that. My issue was, yes, Kentucky Brown Jackson, what are you even saying in terms of it, it worries you that the First Amendment is going to hamstring the government? Yes, but we don't have to look very far. It was it's on this court on the record where you were not impervious to erroneous facts that were perpetuated in mass media only to be mm. undone later, but not to the same degree that the damage was done in terms of worrying the public that children were at risk for whatever reason. I'm going to be very careful about how I talk about it, but it, yeah. it, it why from Justice Sotomayor. Well, I, I don't want to disrespect the monetization of the video in this platform. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, that's a good reason. Okay. Well, but and also, I, also, for what it's wor also for what it's worth, I, I think there is a genuine difference about when you're talking about during the pandemic, for example, because I think in the in the fog of war in the earlier days of COVID, I think that the the calculus you would use to try to figure out if it meets certain thresholds is more likely to be triggered. Sotomayor's, because of the uncertainty. Sotomayor's well, statement was not during the fog that. of war. It was not. She was. She no. was talking about this at the time that we were that they were talking. They were talking about keeping on. I was just saying generally and, and mandating nurses to get to to to, yeah. to get various on the language. Oh, here, on the here, language. language. Here, I'm here, you know, the, the, mandating the, nurses to to get certain treatments. And that was that was like a year and a quarter into the, into the situation, and she's yeah. still misstating facts. And frankly, I think that she is infinitely worse than KBJ. I think Sotomayor is the worst justice in in American in American history. I, I couldn't believe that she never corrected herself, never never apologized. I mean, that was such a. I don't even know if there are eighty million children in the country, much less eighty million children who are who are quote unquote in hospitals to justify that ridiculous decision. Wow. That frankly, the right side of the court was all too happy to march along with as well, because because that's the world we're living in right Joe, now. Joe, you're you're maligning a woman that once asked me to dinner. Um, so we'll have to talk someday about my dinner with Sonia. But I want to talk about that, the public health. The pub, this was before she was a justice. I don't want you scandal mongers out there thinking of anything. But um, the, she is the, single, so hey, go get it. Okay, let me. Oh no, no, that wasn't it. You know, you're going to make me tell the story. Really? But I want to. The available? lead case in the public health state was the 1905 Massachusetts versus Jacobson, and this decision came up time and again we litigated yeah. covid cases around the country uh for a group called we the patriots um i can't remember if it's an llc or whatnot and it was my despair because that was a pre-incorporation case and so somehow this pre-incorporation case that sort of glommed on to some mm -hmm. free-floating notion of the due process clause was made to cram down um these regulations in the face of all manner of first amendment and, and other amendment challenges and the supreme court used i guess fog of war reasoning to say this the emergency justified the circumstances and created a body of law that'll make it easier to trigger the public state uh the public health state or a public emergency state later on and that's directly inconsistent with cases like the youngtown youngstown steel case in 52. we had an emergency we're fighting the korean war the steel mills are about to get ready to shut down. Eisenhower, Eisenhower seized them, and the court said, no, under the separation of powers doctrine, you couldn't do that. The Bill of Rights has as much teeth as that. And so I, I didn't want to die of COVID any more than the next guy. But in a, I don't want to live in a republic of virtue either. Or where, where some public health professional gets gets to tell me how many times I got to chew, what kind of toothbrush I got to use, and how many you know how many stalks of broccoli to consume per week. So I, I'm 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 you know I I'm, I'm re that's a profoundly troubling area of the law in my view because we don't yet have an intelligent um, in post incorporation view of the First Amendment in in, in other amendments in the, in the public health context. You would think after Korematsu, the the Supreme Court would have learned its lesson about just ignoring. <laughs> Civil, the Bill of Rights because yeah, of a quote-unquote emergency. But apparently, I, I don't know that we're ever going to have a, uh, a Supreme Court that yeah. we can be confident will learn the lessons of Korematsu. I, right, I want to jump to a, a, a final story, which has nothing to do with anything, but it's great to get everybody on the panel here and their opinion. I do occasionally get suggestions from Twitter or X or whatever. I like to dead name Twitter. It's a, my or dead name X. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, get your opinions on this because uh, here we go. Legal mente AI. Lawyers are expensive. Our AI reviews legal contracts for free, trained on expert legal minds. Uh -huh. Interesting so Latino coding here. Has anybody caught that? So uh, legal mente, yeah. mente, you know, legally, it's it's a Spanish Spanish relation there. Um, so something I learned while I was I was in Chile for um, about three weeks recently, and that's that's part of why I wasn't around for a while. 
Hmm. But I learned quite a bit about the Spanish legal system while I was down there. So I'm just interested in that type of thing and, and learn. And uh, in in the Spanish system, they have a category of practitioners called the notario. Uh, you know, we think of a notary public as somebody who just sort right. of stamps whatever paper is, you know, put in, in front of them to certify that, you know, somebody somebody signed it in their presence. Uh, but the notario in uh, Spanish, uh, the legal system there is, is quite different. It's actually an attorney who has um, a significant amount of experience, a certain amount of standing in the community. And they take on these very specific roles in the legal process, including a lot of contract preparation and contract review. And so this has come up in my own community. We have a very large uh, Hispanic community here, mostly uh, from Mexico. Uh, and so there have been cases of unauthorized practice of law and, and things like that, unfair businesses practices um, charged against folks who, who come here and advertise themselves as notarios, provide these types of legal services and, and are you know certainly not practicing attorneys under, under the laws of our state. So that's just um, a little side piece there that I, I find interesting. It looks to me like this is targeting uh, the Hispanic community who would expect a non-lawyer to be providing that type of service. Interesting. Hmm. Any other the thoughts? On... Are, they are lawyers, are they not, in the Mexican system? In the Mexican system, yes. They are They yeah. are lawyers of very high standing. Yeah. Well, hopefully... Are they like barristers in England, or what? how does that work? Um, so the way that it works is they're basically, they have, there's a, an experience requirement. I forget if it's like 10 years or 15 years or whatever like that, but you have been a practicing attorney uh, in, in the court for a significant amount of time, and uh, you have to be nominated, I believe, possibly by a judge or by another notario. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like just a, a, an elevated subsection of the bar. It's not so much like the the solicitor barrister distinction that the UK system has, uh, but it's basically just a, like, like a super lawyer, like an official super lawyer uh, that's entrusted with certain kinds of tasks in their system. Well, there was another. Wasn't it Washington that just said we don't you don't need to pass the bar to be a lawyer yeah. anymore? So yes. Washington, okay, so Washington has um, for decades now had alternative pathways to a uh, bar admission. Uh, the, the big Just one has been work. online, yeah. which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a $250,000 contribution to your charitable choice. I can't yeah, sell, right. but can I be a lawyer? You know? <laughs> So, so we've we've actually had all alternative pathways for a long time. Um, we had an, an apprenticeship program for for quite a significant. New York has um, that too. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, and and, and so uh, what this is basically doing is this is uh, trying to create new alternative pathways, um, and, and some of those involve you know basically intensive internships where you would then be qualified on the basis of actual practical experience versus your ability to like memorize stuff and spit it out in an exam setting without you know being able to research and and, and stuff like that the idea just basically being you know the bar exam for most people it's not a practical test at all it has very little relationship to your ability to actually perform as an attorney because it's not a real world setting. You're never, Euro. you know, in isolation where you can't. And look you at can't bill for whatever. taking it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Hold on. What about the reverse? So I live in Virginia. In mm -hmm. my state, I could take the bar mm -hmm. and not um, go to school. So how is it? Um, how how does that work? Because I feel like that's the opposite. Do they require a, a degree in Washington? And is that degree supposedly more valuable than the uh, real life um, apprenticeship? So. With all of the different pathways, the standard pathway is you get your degree, you get your law, your JD from an accredited institution, and you pass the bar exam. That's the mm -hmm. traditional pathway. The um, uh, apprenticeship pathway that's that's been in existence for some time does not require a law degree. That's That's been the whole point. It's kind of a way to uh, mm -hmm. be able to go in and qualify on the basis of experience rather than going through, going through law school. But there are still typically... Um, fairly standard like curricula that you have to go through there there is still like a study you know component to that type of a program mm -hmm. and i believe that's still the case for for these new these new alternatives as well so i see it as they're they're just trying to one you know not not place undue emphasis on the relationship of being able to take a test and and to like endure this kind of you know, but, but lawyer hazing experience say? that we go through with the quality of legal service that you can actually provide 
Hold on, but uh, didn't they explicitly say it's because the bar exam is racist? I thought I read that. That's right. Yeah, it's, whole, part of, yeah. it's part of the rationale. So, so it's really it's not about rationale. comforting everybody. It's a specific targeting, right? See, it's, and, it's, yeah. it's it's race is part of it, but uh, it, it's also, you know, socioeconomic circumstances and things like that that are connected with race, but are not necessarily, you know, race themselves. Uh, the idea being that, yeah, your ability to go to law school, to be able to go to undergraduate school, you know, meet these qualifications, uh, these are resource based types types of opportunities that, that people particular you know people well, what about for yeah. like, yeah. the way yeah. people yeah. say oh my god i want all lawyers that are over 30 or 40 years old because at least i know that they've passed a certain level i'm i'm being serious here mm -hmm. you know as a citizen are you going to say oh oh yeah you're one of those huh? uh we, we don't know anybody <laughs> under a certain age we don't even know if they have passed a bar that that could worry the public or, or maybe I'm just being silly. I'll take the other position. Go ahead, Andrea. Well, I was just going to say, I, I do think that there are still some questions about transparency and are we going to be able to know which pathway did my attorney take, you know, to, to, to be able to become licensed in the state of, of Washington? Not. You never have to worry about transparency in this country. <laughs> no. <laughs> because I, mean, I, I think that's legitimate. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a, free market minded type of person. I like competition. I like different pathways. Mm -hmm. I like people to have, you know, different things that they can choose from and, and see what works and see what doesn't. Uh, having a bar exam certainly has not prevented unqualified people who should not be practicing law from, supreme, from practicing law. And from becoming so, Supreme Court justices. Well, that's true. But it, it has some of them who can't do it becoming LA uh, mayors. Yeah. Like, you know that you know, so, I mean, <laughs> Katanji barred the playing of Helen Reddy we, in her chambers. Although she we've had great Supreme Court that justices, song, Ma'am Woman. You know, she just can't figure it out. She hears that and she's like, "I am what?" You know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we've we've had great Supreme Court justices in the past with less formal education. I think there's been a few that didn't go to college. Well, I, I'm fine with that, but I'm just saying so. the bar yeah. isn't necessarily that's wrong. That's where the pressure should be applied. If I, if I may, uh, the trend in in legal education right now is for more practice ready stuff. There's a move toward. Uh, going to two and a half years, right? Trying to yes. accelerate the path through the institution. But the most expensive part of legal education is the accreditation, the accredited law schools and those sort of institutions that um, mm -hmm. are now being guarded by uh, sort of that federally backed student loan that's not dischargeable through bankruptcy, except right. those same institutions are lowering their admission standards and extending legal educations to those that are historically unrepresented, who have uh, lesser meritocratic indicators that would have historically gotten them into these various institutions but these same people are not actually uh immune to the debt that they're taking and oftentimes mm. they're the ones that graduate if they do graduate with the most debt right yeah. and so if, if the if the argument here is that the bar exam was really what's standing in the way of people matriculating into the practice of law and becoming effective effective counselors or extending the ability to become a professional service provider that those to those who have historically been unrepresented, we start with the institutions that are responsible for educating them and reform mm -hmm. that. The threshold for the bar exam is a minimum competency to practice law. It has been, it's always been that way. And I'm very, I'm very aware of the criticism of the bar. And I think there's parts of that criticism that I agree with, but I will tell you from my personal experience, that was probably the most salient experience of hazing in, in terms of preparation to pass the bar exam in my entire life. And I can apply that same assumption to everybody on this panel to say that there was one time in your life when you were probably pressed beyond the limits that you had already set for yourself. And if you pass the bar exam, even because you don't know what you scored, right? Does anybody here know what they scored when they passed the bar exam? 196. I, I could look Most it up. Good. Although I don't know the first time. <laughs> I actually studied for it and passed the bar twice. We didn't do MBA Texas. when I took it. Virginia doesn't tell you the score. You see, I, I guess I, I, I'm of the mindset now. Again, I am not a lawyer here or whatever, and I don't even have a, a BA. Um, I personally <laughs> would trust a jailhouse lawyer who managed to study up and get all the way through the bar over somebody who graduated in law school and never took the bar. That's but just the, my you know own what? personal you're, Eric, bias. you're completely correct. And I'm sort of so torn about this situation with Washington and that's unfolding across the country because like Michael, I think is implying here, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I, I too, I have a very, very serious issue with the idea that there even should there, that there must be a requirement 
for anyone to be able to engage in any any form of profession. That, and I think it's a very it's something that we we took from old England and their perspectives about the judicial about how just the judiciary should operate. Yeah, we're a guild. In we're a guild. Let's just that, that the we're, we're, there's an exclusivity to the guild. And yeah, I think we're, cabal, and, we're a trust. And I'll tell you something. I I don't like. It. I don't like it for electricians. I don't like. It. I don't. I don't like it. I think that you should be able to stand up on your own and say if someone wants to take a person as their representative, whether it's an individual or a corporation, that they should be able to say, "Look, I know this is this person isn't a lawyer. I just think that." So they you want my cousin well. Vinny writing your trust? Absolutely. I think, I think that it's. I don't. <laughs> I, I'm. I might not choose him, but someone else should have the freedom to choose him. That's my. And point. I remember and I one need night. I to tell you, but my cousin Vinny is already writing your trust. There, I don't know. I remember sitting in law school one day, and in, in a in criminal in criminal something or other, whether it was law or procedure, thinking there out of the seventy or so people in there, there weren't three or four that I'd trust with a parking ticket. And now everybody, you know, I think the public is entitled to say that a person who's got the JD has demonstrated some minimal competence to recognize the issue that's walking in the door. And oh, without yeah. the bar exam, how are we going to do that? Yeah, I, well, I guess if they through, have a JD, It's through the practical you... experience and the, and the demonstration of the ability to perform the tasks that a lawyer needs to perform. Who wants to be on the end of the practical? Degree. Who wants now, to be I... on the end of the practical experience? Hi, let me be your practical experience as I'm defending my life. Well, Eric, I well, can give you the example. I can give you the, the, the example because I'm 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 very radical in this regard. Okay, I believe right. there needs to be a formal pathway for jailhouse lawyers to be able to qualify as oh, I agree. Wow. attorneys. We agree, okay? but I love and the I will tell you exactly why. I I have seen so many you know j jailhouse lawyers. I've seen so much of their work, and just like lawyers as a whole, some of it is trash. Uh, but some of it is actually quite good. Some of these guys are extremely educated. They know the resources. They know how to make the arguments. They know the case law. And the problem that you have in especially the criminal justice system is that post-conviction work. In the state of Washington, you don't have a right to an attorney for that type of work. So you don't get somebody appointed to you to file your personal restraint petition, to present your new evidence, to investigate it, to raise things that you can't raise on direct appeal because you don't have a record of your attorney at trial arguing it to the trial court. So there's a massive realm of litigation that happens in this post-conviction world that you don't get an attorney appointed to you to do it. And so who carries that burden? Jailhouse lawyers carry nearly the entire burden of post-conviction litigation in the state of Washington. I and I would I would suspect probably in the, in the country as a whole. I they get no credit yeah. for it, I they get no benefit for it. They get no standing for it. They are developing all of these skills that are going to be beneficial for re-entry into society, but we're going to deprive them of that opportunity in order to protect and the country. Oh, that sounds like that sound we're in really that good. I'll just hire them as a paralegal. All they can't do hey, one of the most inspiring their name on the end. If it's one of the most good, inspiring stories just... in the law that I'm aware of is yeah. Sean Hopgood's. You know, he he was a jailhouse lawyer. He got whacked up for bank <laughs> robbery in the Midwest. He yes. got himself free. He's helped with a lot of petitions. Wonderful um, book he wrote. And now, yeah, I can't remember the title. Do you remember? But Did he's he now pass the bar norm? I'll look it up. I don't know, but he's part of the. Well, he, I guess so because he's a member of the Georgetown That's what Legal I'm saying. Clinic. Right That's now. what I'm saying. I love jailhouse lawyers. I love that aspect. I'm just saying, here's a threshold, and th most of them can pass it. Andrea, you know, a lot of them they do good work. Can they pass the bar? Probably. That's why I kind of lean towards where I am in Virginia, where somebody can be an apprentice, they can work, they can do whatever, and then there is some degree of a test or whatever that puts them on an equal footing. I, I don't know. I think we're in a heated agreement. No, my, no, I, we're not. Because question. Your we're ability because... to practice post-conviction work as, as a criminal practitioner has no relationship to what you might know about negotiable instruments or what you might know about secured transactions or these other mandatory things that get tested on the bar exam that are literally just a memory test because you're always in practice going to be able to look up the rules and evaluate the situation. It's not like the bar exam at all. But if you're a criminal practitioner, the likelihood of you needing to know how to enforce a mechanics lien is extremely low. So the benefit of, of testing all of this stuff is, is really, to me, extremely questionable. So shift the test. 
attest to what, what is actually going to be required. He has to know what kind of lawyer they want to be for the rest of their life. I, I guess what I'm saying is that the minimum competency standard is to give you a breadth of, of, of application to how diverse the law actually is. Because I, I take the point that, yeah, a criminal defense attorney doesn't necessarily know necessarily have to know how to how to record a deed of trust or secure a position of priority on a, on a over a mortgage instrument or whatever else. But but the problem is life for a practitioner is pretty long. Right. The career arc is pretty long and there are, are pretty rigid standards every year for continuing legal education, et cetera. I mean, it's a self-governing profession. All I wanted to make my biggest point within all of this, because I think it's a great debate. But my biggest point within all of this is that the inflated cost of education is not in any way reflected mm -hmm. in the product that the stu of the graduating students. And, and as a as a very recent law grad, and I say recent in terms of the context of the panel, but you know, having been a legal yeah, writer. Drop that, today, will you? Yeah, why don't you just Andrea, you should be no, he's you not supposed to bitch. talk about well, a woman. Not, not a bitch. Bitch. But what I'm saying is <laughs> that your mother's saying, milk but, on your chin, or did you drink, drop oh the mayonnaise off your hot dog? The shortcomings of this are obvious because my law school doesn't exist anymore. I graduated Mine from doesn't my law either. school. Right. So so there are nice. consortium law schools that have been attacked by the federal by, by the federal administrations. They were deprived of their ability to actually extend federally backed student loans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the commonality between them was what bar passage rates were super low. Right. That the students that they were bringing through these curriculum were either not they didn't have enough statistics or sufficient statistics to be admitted with a reasonable likelihood of graduating and passing the bar or they just their bar passage rates were super low. And so the product itself, this is a consumer protection argument ultimately because there are people out in the world that need effective legal advocacy. So the problem is principally the inputs are being manipulated in a way to appease some idea that we are more egalitarian in the access to the prestige of the practice of law, but the product is super poor, but we're going to blame the problem on the inability for people to pass the threshold exam that would demonstrate to the rest of the world that for an acute moment, this person can prepare over a diversity of, 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 of chapters of the law Right. And demonstrate a proficiency that is minimally competent so that they can continue their cycle of learning and evolution as a practitioner and give that and give the fruits thereof to other people that need it. Right. But but they're grad. So the context here is, OK, we're going to protect the 60 to 70 thousand dollar you know, tuition per year yes. and the debt that can't be discharged through bankruptcy. And then yes. law school has nothing to do with the business of practicing law. So how many of these students are going to have the wherewithal to start their own firm or, or, or be entrepreneurial, actually learn how to do something outside of the grand vision and the current established way of practicing law? Because I think the inspiration for this conversation was what, AI? Right. We right. Looked yep. at, and, and so, <laughs> that was the genesis. Right? Well, welcome to I went there. Back law. So, I, so, I mean, <laughs> so what you're at, I would agree with everything you're saying, Michael, that the that the, the healthiest resolution here is if law school was transitioned from being get an undergraduate degree, then spend another three years in law school to treating law school as a trade, a trade school yep. where where it's the, that. And, and I'll tell you something. We actually ha had that for a long time and i yes. know this because my criminal procedure professor and i went to a to a school that was that was you know still is pretty well regarded it's not one of the, it's not top tier but it's it's pretty it's pretty well regarded and my professor was a guy who went to New York Law School, not NYU, New York Law School. And he's the one who introduced us to the concept that New York Law School would proudly advertise that while they were a much, much lower tier school than the one he was teaching in, that their bar passage rate was better than NYU because they were so fixated on training their students who were not these elitist, you know, or, or who were either the product of money or 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 very high necessarily success in at an undergraduate level but that they were they were dedicated towards learning this particular trade and and that they were gearing them towards being prepared to take on whatever avenue of law they would decide to go down in their professional careers and and that translated into success in the bar at a greater rate greater rate than the top schools in the country and I think that that's a much healthier approach towards having adequate representation for our, for our public than than this current system we have, which basically seems like a, a relic of old England that is that gives undue deference 
to to elite to, to elitist educational perspectives and to, to 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 the rich as well as to these traditional schools which now become the 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 institution of this country. Mm -hmm. it I also think that's such legal... an important point, Joe, because that that is a big feature of the law school problem that goes far and beyond just are are they preparing people to practice law? It's the lack of diversity in our institutions at the top. Look at the Supreme Court. How many people have, you know, ever been appointed to the Supreme Court from a non-Harvard, non-Yale, uh, you know, institution? It's 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 rare and rare, and that's the case very much for so many of our institutions. Uh, it's not about the quality of your education; it's about the network. It's about who you know and and who you're able to to mix with. Uh, it's these coming apart problems that uh, Charles Murray wrote about. Uh, so. That's that's a whole other just can of worms that comes into who are we allowing into this profession that has direct influence in it's often a pathway to, to being a legislator to being a governor or something like that is being being an attorney. Uh, and so it's just minimizing the pool of potential ideas and potential backgrounds and and thought processes and stuff. Uh, to simply those people who are already, they were born part of the club and they're going to stay part of the club. It's just, that's a very systemic problem that we have in this country. All right. Well, that's a perfect calming point to wrap up on the day. And th that's why I love oh. these men. <laughs> now, what we do is um, everybody uh, you know pitches their product, things like that. We're going to start off with Norm, who hasn't been here before. And I imagine he probably wants to talk about this. You guys yeah, have I'll, a chin. Mike do my talking for me. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, um, well, well, then we'll. Just gonna let both of you do it. Don't I pass the opportunity. Right. How's well, okay. So my Norm name's Norm Pattis. Thank you very much for the invitation, Eric. You can find us at uh, Mike and I on Law and Legitimacy, where we talk each morning, uh, eight o'clock Eastern time, for a half an hour or so, and we try to spot legal issues that are interesting, and we try to rely on real documents and discuss their meeting so that when you read the newspaper, you're not blown away by misperception. I've been involved in any number of cases that are so-called high profile. Alex Jones, the Proud Boys, um, um, Saif Khan, you mentioned earlier. I could go on and on. The thing that always strikes me about these cases is that what you read in the paper isn't necessarily what's happening in the room. And it's not a question of ill will. It's not a question of bad judgment. It's a question of the law's complexity. So if you have an interest in law and how it intersects with your world, um, check us out at Law and Legitimacy. We're also preoccupied with the ancient Ciceronian question, and that is, how do you arrive at a sense of legitimacy? What what distinguishes law from power? And it's two things, um, a common conception or common interest and a common conception of right. We say the bottom has fallen out of pluralism. We're trying to have civil discussions that go right to the heart of issues that permit you to reconstruct a world that seems to be disintegrating around us as we speak. So check us out at Law Pod Daily. We'd love to have you there. All right. We got them to almost 600, folks. Let's mm -hmm. see if we can push them all the way to 1,000. Um, and that helps them get monetized. Andrea, you haven't released anything for a while, but thank God we have you here. And I hope this is an outlet for you when you're not able to release on your channel. Well, it, it is. I, I really enjoy being here, Eric, and I, I appreciate you continuing to to invite me back because I, I have a great time and I love these these types of conversations that we get to have. Uh, so these days I'm mostly on Twitter. My handle is is there on the screen at Aberkart Law. I do have a YouTube channel that has been a bit dormant for some time, uh, but do want to uh, give some people a heads up that I've had some Changes I've been making with my personal situation to hopefully allow me a little bit more time to be able to get back into. All right, uh, whose heart did you break? Come on, cut it. <laughs> you know, cut to the chase. Not my husband's. <laughs> He's a boxer. Be careful, Norm. <laughs> so uh, I am. I am looking forward to uh, hopefully getting back up to life uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, I am going to be following some of the trials that are upcoming. Some of the criminal trials uh, that I've had folks. Um, you know, ask me for my opinions about the Karen Reed case, uh, the Richard Allen, uh, one that I, I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so basically, yeah, I have not had a lot to say on YouTube uh, so far, but I am hoping to be able to change that uh, in the very near future. All right. Now, we I tend to rotate around. Essentially, I always get in a manner to make Joe last, just so people know this. <laughs> um, Mike. It's time to be the second pitch for the a new channel. 
Yeah, I um so I, a few years ago I I begged and pleaded with a colleague to just make Norm answer my my messages. I, I heard a um a really <laughs> Uh, That's true. I'm bad that way. <laughs> a really profound audio clip that he just, you know, I guess published on LinkedIn somehow, and the and the quality was horrible. But what I heard in Norm through that one clip was something that, as a as a young lawyer and someone that felt as though I had a lot more philosophically to learn, that I, I wanted to be around. And all I really ever wanted to do with Norm is is give him a platform to do what he did today for for the panel. Um, and so this has evolved from just the long form, uh, sort of more static interviews to a daily live stream where, as you said, we, we attack issues from the perspective that, uh, that America is suffering from a crisis of legitimacy, that uh, we lack a common vision of the good uh, and, and an angle upwards as a country, and that lawyers are uniquely positioned to understand the excesses uh, along partisan lines and, and take it from there. Uh, what I learn, I, I, oftentimes I'm learning as much as the audience is because Norm is an encyclopedia when it comes to a command of philosophy and sort of the founding, uh, the founding stuff uh, that, that, that grips us here. Uh, so we'd love to have you, uh, whatever you've got uh, in terms of a sub, we'd love that. So thank you, thank you, Eric, as well. We're all we are, we've hit over six hundred, so we've increased our subscriber count by over two hundred just by being here. Law Pod Daily, thank you guys. Kurt, what do you have going on? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm one, I'm the channel on civil law. I do a lot of Supreme Court and Court of Appeal analysis. It's weird. Is he faking? No, that'd uh, be amazing. Kurt, I lost your sound. I'd love it. This is Helen Keller telling you turn it up. <laughs> Kurt, Kurt. <laughs> All right, how's that? No, let's well, sort of, uh, sort keep, of keep going, bit. keep you going a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, Let me turn you up here, see if it helps. Yeah, uh, I run the YouTube channel on civil law. We do a lot of Supreme Court and Court of Appeal analysis. Uh, we like to go to the to the primary source documents as well, so we read a lot of Supreme Court opinions. We also do a Supreme Court oral argument review. We've got some good ones coming up that we have to cover. I'm looking forward to starting to do the merits briefs on the idea of whether Trump enjoys immunity or his official acts in office or not. So I'm looking forward to covering those. And there's some great oral arguments that we have to cover dealing with uh, issues such as uh, whether or not, for example, the state of New York can put pressure on people to not do business with the NRA because they don't like the NRA and its message. So some good stuff coming up in the First Amendment arena. So we do a lot of Supreme Court react and the oral argument react. We do a lot of Court of Appeals stuff, reading the documents. And then also we do trials from time to time as there happens to be one that happens. So those are some of the things we cover and look forward to look forward to covering more stuff. All right. And we always save Joe for last where he pitches what he has coming up and generally we'd like to say has a word of wisdom, but I just say a word um, to close out the show. Yeah. So my name is uh, Joe. People call me good logic. I am. I urge you to check me out, goodlogic.locals.com. I'm going to be putting a link up there in a few moments where I'm going to, I plan on going over this afternoon. This afternoon, I'm, I plan on walking you through Letitia James' opportunities, if any, to seize Trump buildings in order to satisfy this absurd judgment that was entered by Judge Engeron against, against Donald Trump and how that process might play out with respect to payment of bills and all that other stuff and how, how that whole procedure would work. Because I did, believe it or not, I, I did engage in judgment execution at some point in a prior <laughs> life. So in the state of New York, where it does vary significantly from one state to another. So I, I know how judgment execution works in the state of New York. And I plan on basically giving you perspectives as to what opportunities uh, Letitia James may have and how and what, what positions Trump is taking and and can take and i plan going through that on a not on youtube i'm not gonna be doing youtube or rumble it's gonna be on playback you'll find links for that over at goodlogic.locals.com so i urge you to check out goodlogic.locals.com um yeah so that that was basically it and it was funny when 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 andrea was was giving very insightful perspectives about education i came up with the greatest idea for how to fix the entire educational system for 